Hello and welcome to Talk from Superheroes. Hey everybody, I'm Andrew Riveme. And I'm Diana McCullum. And you're listening to Talk from Superheroes, where every week we discuss a piece of heroic television or film. And this week on the podcast, we are talking about Mission Impossible 3. The third one. The th- we, we gotta go back. The third MI3 for the brief moment when they were like, what if this franchise will be called MI and a thing? And then was like, nah, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Uh, But Mission Impossible 3, MI3, we're building up to uh, next week's release of uh, Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1. I think that's the title. And I think that's the title. I always say it with a mild confidence Uh anytime it comes up. I've been appreciating that they're not hiding the Part 1 in this title. Way to go, guys. Yeah, because we've discussed this a couple of times now where it's like a few different part ones, like cowards, have given up on it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, Where they're mm -hmm. like, it's Dune part one. And then focus testing showed no one wants to see a part one. And they were like, it's just Dune. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Except for the whole story. Don't worry about it. We finish it. Into the Spider-Verse part one. And they're like, no, it's into the Spider-Verse. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. And then Fast X never even said they were a part one, but they're a part one. They were, you know what? They never even were brave enough to... I at least appreciate that they knew they were cowards from the jump. <laughs> Vin Diesel, known coward. Yeah, yeah. I, I appreciate to be like, no, nah, I'm hiding that shit. Versus movies that are like, I am Spartacus. And then everyone looks at you. You're like, actually, no, nah, I'm not Spartacus. I was, I got kind of swept up. Don't mm-hmm. know. Like, I will say this. Tom Cruise is a lot of things, but he's not a coward. <laughs> Very fair. (laughs) Very fair. fair. He's like, I will put part one in the title. I'm a brave, brave man. Yeah, okay. (laughs) Part one of question mark? Yeah, You don't even care. He's going to jump off a mountain with a banner that's like, part one. Also, the banner is my parachute. Yes, he'll do it all. He'll do it all. Uh, So we're talking about MI3 today, uh, and we are joined by our guest, uh, friend of the podcast, the editor-in-chief of the the website, The Beaverton. It's our friend, Luke Gordonfield. Hello, Luke. Hello. How dare you guys go on a hilarious riff when I couldn't jump in? <laughs> <laughs> I was saving my best material for before you're here. Yes. As I was is just, tradition. I was like, do I stifle my laughter so as to not give away the surprise? <laughs> uh, your name's in the title <laughs> yeah, of that's the podcast a, episode. Now that you sure. point that out, that was a silly move on my part. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but yeah. I still did it. I was sitting here with my hand over my mouth like we were in church. Now, was it the MI3 or was it the part one more that was getting to Oh, it was that? Tom Cruise is a lot of things, but he is no coward. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> For sure. All right, that's fair. That's fair. All of it was great, but I have to give the win to Diane on that one. Yeah, yeah. He will like yeah, he will put his birth date and then a question mark on, as the subtitle for the next movie. Like he does not care. It'll be like, do I die? Uh that's that's the mystery that he wants. We've been saying for a while that I, I can't believe that in the I think it was the last one or like the the previous one that came out uh, to the right, most right, recent right, yeah. one where he did the big underwater stunt. Oh, that was and two ago. That was two ago. It was like, I can't believe James Cameron didn't direct that one because James Cameron has wanted to drown <laughs> someone for a while mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. and Tom Cruise has wanted to die. And it's like, can we just pair these up as angels of mercy and death <laughs> and just and just finish it? Yeah. I mean, that would be such a great pairing that I'm trying. I'm racking my brain. They've never worked together, have they? I don't think they have, no. actually. James oh my God, Cameron that's such an does, obvious pairing. Yeah, he yeah. does so few films. Yeah, t- Tom Cruise would have to like be in Avatar 4 at this point because <laughs> yeah, there's no true. other yeah. option there's, for James Cameron. We're running out the clock on Cameron. Yeah, yeah he's not mm-hmm. He's not. He really signed on for else. too many Avatars. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's, and, and even the next one, I think, got pushed back. So it's like, <laughs> I straight up think 30 years of his life is going to be Avatar. So Tom's going to need to get blue or figure something out. Yeah, Tom Cruise ain't making it to the end of the avatars. No. He will not see the final avatar the way he lives his life. No, he he, he certainly will not. He certainly will not. And uh, so, so Luke, uh, we appreciate you being here. You were the, the editor-in-chief of uh, of the, the wonderful satirical news site, The Beaverton, uh, a uh, a, a wonderful website. Uh, it was also a wonderful television series that I was uh, very lucky to be part of, and that was that was very fun as well. And uh, yeah, just let people know about your thing. Thank you for having me. And yes, the, it was all great, and it led to one of I, have we said this on the podcast? My favorite moments in you calling me out of our friendship. Oh, where, <laughs> oh I, I don't think we've ever mentioned this where, on the pod. Where and sorry for the complete tangent. Where. We were just, years after the show ended, uh, we were over at our our friend uh, Ian McIntyre's house, and we were just having some drinks and chatting, and you made a a joke about how you auditioned for a lot of cops, and you have cop face. And I was like, I don't think that's true. And then you took, like, a beat, a sip of your drink, and then went, you cast me as a cop twice on your show. (laughs) (laughs) And your show, you know this, 
didn't have that many episodes. Nope. So two episodes of Cop Andrew, not recurring character. Yeah. No, and, different cops because yeah. you were in the pilot and then yep. and then we kind of forgot <laughs> that you were a cop in the pilot. We thought you were great, but it was like such a broad thing yeah, yeah. that it was like, was that a cop? Who cares? And then you were late, later in a much more serious, like satirical bit. I'm a straight, yeah. I'm a straight faced cop. A hundred percent. As opposed to the first one where you're like, wackety schmackety cop. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was a wackety schmackety sure. cop. Cop. That is absolutely true. <laughs> cop. Uh, but yes, that was, yeah, I look so much like a cop. I have played a cop twice on your television show. So that's uh, that's my resting cop face. Yeah. And no. it's not and not a cop show for the listeners who maybe <laughs> no, aren't familiar. Wasn't. So some listeners might be listening to me like, that must be Canada's law and order. Yeah, it yeah. was not. It was not. No, that's coming out soon. <laughs> that is, oh, yeah. yeah, I guess. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Andrew, you're going to play so many cops. So oh, many cops. Oh, Actually, I, all the cops will be American, but you can play so many uh, bad guys. Yeah, I will play. Well, hey, if you're working on Law & Order Toronto, get at me. <laughs> I would love it. You might have played all the cops on the Beaverton. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it might have been 100% of the cops. Uh, with a resume like that, get at me, Law & Order Toronto. <laughs> Uh, well, before we get into our episode today, we want to thank our sponsor of today's episode. We want to thank our friends over at Mint Mobile. I am especially thanking Mint Mobile. Thank you so much because they offer premium wireless starting at just 15 bucks a month. And it's like, well, that's that's not real. And it's real and it's great. And it's such a wonderful service. And because of their because of their very affordable pricing and simple pricing, it's just easy to like figure out what's going on. Like I was on their website. I'm activating my phone. And it's like... I've, I've been with other cell phone providers where like I'm on their website and they're like, it is a $60 minimum if you have one of our fun bundles. What are the fun bundles? Enjoy 14 other tabs you'll have open while you try to figure it out. And I'm like, I don't know what's happening. And then you get to one page. It's like, we only accept itchy and scratchy money. Uh, but Mint Mobile, I'm, I'm there. I'm setting up my phone plan. And it's like $15. And I'm like, human dollars? Yes. Do I need to do other things? No. no it's it's straight, just It's boom, straightforward. Right simple there. plans. You can see what's going on. I actually think it's worse when you go to a brick and mortar cell phone place and like, I printed off this eight page contract. You don't get to read it. Just sign it and then get the hell out of our store. Mint Mobile saves you all this money because they don't have brick and mortar stores. It's all online and that's why it's so affordable. And all their plans have unlimited talk and tax. They include uh, high speed data as well as delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. You can use your own phone with Mint Mobile and keep your same phone number as well. You can just port it all over. It's very simple. It's very simple. Yeah, you go online, you get the plan, and they will send you your SIM card in the mail. Or if you have an eSIM, you can just do it. You can get the code and just set it up right away. Yeah, and I, I love porting over. I love porting over my own phone number. You can just keep it the same, even though you're switching providers. And also, it's like it's so fast and easy. You go to port a phone number over, and it'll be like this might take a couple of hours, and then like. Three seconds later, it's like, oh, it's been done. It's been, we took it. We got it's it. It's here now. It's yours, and no one else gets to have it, and that's nice. Uh, so they have plans starting at fifteen bucks a month, uh, fifteen bucks a month to get your new wireless plan for just fifteen bucks a month, and get the plan shipped to your door for free. Go to mintmobile.com/tfs. That's mintmobile.com/tfs. Cut your wireless bill to fifteen bucks a month at mintmobile.com. TFS, and thank you, Mint Mobile, for your support. Thank you, Mint Mobile, so much. And now, let's get into the episode. Let's talk about Mission Impossible 3. Am I 3? Right, we have seen Mission Impossible three. Uh, I believe all of us for not not the first time. We're all revisiting this. I've never seen it. Oh, really? yeah! Wow, we got a fresh first time with Diana. Virgin MI three. <laughs> there we go. Well, let's start with your fresh take. Then let's start with the the usual, the simple question of Did you like it, Diana? Did you like it? I loved it. I have been a long holder that Ghost Protocol is like easily the best Mission Impossible. But I hadn't seen this one, and this one's a real close contender. I really Ooh. liked it. Um, like it's 
got so much action, but the action is wildly motivated by the plot. It's like fun and it's clever. You get to see how they do everything. They don't think the audience is dumb, but they also like show you how everything works. I had such a great time with this movie. It never stops. Um, yeah, I think like it could use like a little bit more character development for anyone who's not Ethan Hunt. But other than that, yeah. it's just like, wow, it is fun to watch and it's a real ride. I had a, I still think I still think Ghost Protocol's better, but I had I had an excellent time. I was surprised how much I loved this for a movie I hadn't seen. Yeah, everyone, get on MI three if you haven't seen it. <laughs> wow. So I, good. Wow. Okay. So coming so in strong. Coming in strong with the first coming viewing. Strong and hot. Luke, did you like it? Yeah. Oh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I did. I do like it. It's just that completely the opposite of you. I think it so pales in comparison to what comes after it. Mm. And it is a fairly typical mid 2000s action movie that is only saved, not saved, but is that extremely elevated by Philip Seymour Hoffman as as the villain Owen Davian. And everything else is decent to good and he is great. And I think that's what makes it a like to cl- almost close to love for me at times, but for the most part just a like. Ah, okay, interesting. Interesting. And well, Andrew I- I can I can get behind both of your takes. I'll split the difference. I will say that I I liked it. I didn't love it. I I probably kind of f- come somewhere in between where both of you are on this one. I do still feel like Ghost Protocol is my favorite, yeah. but I do think that this movie walks so Ghost Protocol can run. Mm. Like mm. this is the one that really allows it to be the franchise that we are seeing today you know it's almost like seeing like fast and furious 10 and it's like well this has nothing to do with one and it's like well that that fourth one was the one that really kind of was like here's the franchise we're doing now this is the this is this is the 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 temperature check this is the trendsetter this is the one that's like okay here's what we are from here on out for better or worse like i i think that it takes what this movie is and as a franchise builds it and kind of gets better and does bigger and wilder set pieces every single time. But I also kind of like what these first three movies were, which was what if we took a franchise and let a director do their own wild personal stamp on it? Uh, Mm -hmm. And sometimes that sucks and sometimes that's great. I kind of would have been interested to see a franchise that continued to do that. But this does kind of like set the tone of everything going forward, I think. It's hard to say what JJ's stamp is. This is a, his directorial debut, mm. but it does like in later ones. I'm like, oh yeah, JJ. He's just like he's fun and frenetic, and he's got great action set pieces. Yeah, I mean, I think this one has more comedy than than some of the later ones, and I, I would attribute a lot of that to JJ's writing style, which is not quippy, but just like subverting expectations in a comedic way. Like the the disposable camera doesn't explode, just a little bit of sp- a puff of smoke <laughs> comes out of it as Tom Cruise kind of holds it and stares off into the distance. Like little things like that where there's small little enjoyable comedic beats throughout that I think especially the last couple of Mission Impossibles are, are so serious. Although actually as I'm saying that, I remember the, the beat with the French cop when they open the doors in the last Mission Impossible is actually very funny before it gets really right. serious right. very quickly. <clears throat> so there, I guess there are elements like that throughout, but I, for whatever reason, this movie strikes me as one of the funnier Mission Impossibles. I can't point to any real laugh line. It's just kind of a general tongue-in-cheekness to it. I think there's there's definitely like a charm to it all throughout where it's like even even in the like the the dinner party kind of opening sequence mm-hmm. where we're like meet uh, Ethan and his now fiance and him just kind of lip reading their conversation through the window and then like popping over and I forget what lake it was or whatever. Winaka, I think. Yeah, and just him being like Lake Winaka and then everyone being like what the hell? <laughs> But it's fun and it's charming and it has this kind of like positive, quick moving energy about it. And also it feels like it is very, especially for the time that this movie came out, very TV writing dialogue, which Mm. is Mm. we do not have time for a quiet expository scene like movies do. We need to bury it in character building. And bury might be the wrong word there, but we need to do multiple things simultaneously. Right. We need the efficiency of television because we got to get this done before the commercial break. And that efficiency is what kind of adds, I think, to a bit of its speed and peppiness and charm. Yeah, I would say, I would agree with the most of that. I actually don't think this is the funniest by far. I would say it's very clever and it's mm. fun to watch, but Simon Pegg only has two scenes. That is the big thing and I noticed. in later movies, yeah. Simon Pegg is in almost every scene. So I'm going to say the next three are way funnier overall. 
A hundred percent. I do think this. Because like in Ghost Protocol, Sorry. when Renner is like going to jump and Simon Pegg's like, and I catch you. And it's this <laughs> sequence yeah, fair about Renner getting caught by this magnet. It's so funny. But this movie I think is clever and charming, but not, I don't actually think it's like all that comedic. I think there's a lot of moments where I'm like, wow, like. I love how it's high tech and then goes like low tech. Like we can make masks out of 3D models in half a second, but also we're going to fool this camera by printing off a Polaroid photo and yeah. putting it in front of it. <laughs> I love the mix of just like old school and like really high tech technology happening. Yeah. And I think I, I also really like even in that, in, in that sequence as well of the like uh, breaking into the Vatican, just like, the costume changes to be like, yeah, we wore like four things. It's a thing on top of a thing. And then I can change kind of, and one person has to awkwardly change while going down a hallway. I'm like, yeah, that, that combination of low and high tech to be like, when we need a crazy tech thing for exposition, we have it. And when we don't, we're clever and fun and have a certain energy about it. Yeah. And I love that the choice too, before they break into the Vatican, when they're doing the, our van broke down outside uh, bit, <laughs> And it's Jonathan Reese Myers and Tom Cruise. And I, I'm sure like a lot of people now, I watch things uh, with subtitles on because I'm off, often watching on low volume. And there were no subtitles for what they were saying. But it was just that classic of like like general a Italian arguing or whatever. That yeah. like classic like Sopranos Yelling meme. in Italian. Yeah, exactly. And so it was just like that, that beat of like, we don't need Tom Cruise. We don't need to put subtitles under this. We just know that if Tom Cruise and Jonathan Reese Myers gesticulate enough with their hands and end a lot of things in vowels, that people will get the gist of what they're doing. Yeah, but and they also sell that scene because there are a couple of points where I'm like, your the veins in your neck and head are popping of two people of like having a true argument. Yeah. Like everyone behind them stuck in traffic. I'm like, yeah, they can feel the vibes. Like this is one of the few points in the Mission Impossible series where I'm like, you're selling a cover. Mm. You sold it. You didn't just put on a nice dress and walk confidently. You had to, yeah. to sell a cover story. Now, it does make me wonder if Tom Cruise and Jonathan Reese Myers learned any Italian if there are no subtitles. Because <laughs> we mean, also they... noticed there were no subtitles for that part. We were like, are they not working? What are they saying? So, like, did they just, like, Mario it like it's the me. <laughs> I mean, Jonathan Reese Myers' uh, accent work in general is a, uh, a question mark on his career and in this movie. So I will say that I wouldn't be shocked if he was, you know, struggling a little bit with the Italian. And they were like, "You got the gist, Jonathan. Yeah, it's all right. You, you gesticulated." Yeah, because yeah. I think for the first fifteen minutes of this movie, he's American, and then the Irish accent just comes yeah, in full yeah, yeah, yeah. force. I actually thought he was Irish the whole time, but thought he was American in real life, and he's an Irish man. No, no, he's, yeah. <laughs> he's from Ireland, and I was like, oh no, well, what is happening? I think for the first portion of the movie as well, he is a man yelling over the sounds of a helicopter. Ooh, that's fair. Which mm -hmm. also makes it hard to notice accents, because he's going syllable by syllable, where he's like, Get inside the <laughs> helicopter. And I'm like, okay, if you go syllable by syllable, it's impossible to have any mm. accent. But like, yeah, it did feel like they just kind of slipped that Irishness in there as it went on. And his name is a, is, a, is an Irish name, but it, but so many American names are were Irish names. So mm. like that doesn't give anything away. And I just feel like there was a moment 20 minutes in where I was like, oh. His accent's back. Like, his natural <laughs> yeah, Irish accent. Yeah, yeah. Now, I could be totally wrong. Maybe if I go back and rewatch the first 10 minutes, he's full on Irish the whole time. But I just remember 20 minutes in, just or, or longer, because he doesn't get introduced right away, just being like, oh, he's Irish. <laughs> like, just like a moment where it's like, oh, they let him be Irish. That's nice. I did notice in the scene where they were speaking Italian, having that argument, and they're selling the shit out of it. It's actually a fun little scene. Yeah, yeah. It's a fun scene and a fun performance. Uh, I do think there was a cue card person holding up phonetic pronunciations because it was the only scene where I noticed both actors had the same eye line. Oh. So like w they would listen to one of the, the other ones say something and when they had to talk, they would both look at the same place <laughs> slightly <laughs> towards the camera. Sketch, yeah. yeah, and then and then say their Italian lines, not looking at the other person and then it's their turn to listen and they would look back. So I'm like, someone was holding up phonetic pronunciation. I'll just say, I know movie budget are not we're not in 2006 what they are now but you think they could have afforded two Italian cue card guys <laughs> you would you would hope they but did shoot it in quite a wide 
<laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah. We saw the whole street. You yeah. One of them was on the Vatican. Yeah. 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 A big cue card. Yeah. A really big, a really big cue we card. We bought the billboard over here. Your lines are on it. It's really weird for everyone driving by. <laughs> Just have some sweary lines. Uh, now, how do we feel about like this the the cold open? Because we're kind of we've, we've been jumping around a little bit, but this movie opens with the the in media res flash forward. Yeah. I bet you're wondering how we got here, which is uh, uh, certainly hacky now, uh, a little bit hackney then, but not quite. I think I as... would say legally required then. Okay. I think I think that was during the three year periods where if you didn't open your media property in media res, you were kicked out of Hollywood. Okay. Uh, <laughs> like, I've, I don't have any statistics backing that up, but I, the second I, it started in media res, I was like, oh, right, it's a mid-2000s movie. Like, yeah. it just, and not, not just because Aaron Paul is weirdly in this, which I forgot about, but I was we immediately all, like, we, we were also yeah. caught off guard by that. Just like fresh out of that Gushers commercial he's famous for, yeah, Aaron Paul. And I was, but I was just immediately like, oh yeah, Breaking Bad. Like, this is exactly what Breaking Bad did, mm. where it starts with, Everything's going to hell. Walter White's about to have a shootout with the cops, whatever. And and so, but I, but I, as hacky as it is, because I agree it's hacky now. The um, what it does very effectively is it introduces us to the villain who we will not see again for quite a while. Mm. Because That's a good point. because like other than people talking about him, we don't see <coughs> Philip Seymour Hoffman for the first hour. I don't think like until we're in Rome, right? Because yeah. like they have the whole br- rescue in Berlin. <coughs> That does not, you know, that 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 it does not involve him at all, even though he's the driving force. So, I think to make the movie have stakes, they either needed to introduce him a lot earlier, or do what they did, which is we're building up to this badass motherfucker who's gonna do what he's about to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm back and forth on it because, like, I do like that it makes the movie start with like I actually hadn't thought about the villain aspect, but you're absolutely right, and that's a really good point. But it starts with like a little bit of action as opposed to starting with just. Ethan Hunt at a party, mm-hmm. which is also very good. It does take away the tension when we get there, like naturally. And you're like, yeah, are we going to count to 10 again? I've already counted all the way to nine. <laughs> like I was there. So you get, you're kind of over it, but it is a good like energy off the top. And it's a good introduction to Philip Seymour Hoffman. So I'm, I'm iffy on it. Yeah, I, I agree. It does put him. I, I, I agree that it's kind of necessary to be like, this is the villain of this movie and get on board because it's tense. But it makes the villain the star of this movie mm-hmm. and he's not in it enough for that either. So I do think it's also kind of like the worst of both worlds. Mm-hmm. I think that this movie was flat out the the way that it was written because it feels like this opening scene wasn't originally like written to be there because it's mm-hmm. not, normally when a scene is written to be there and then we get back to it later, when we get to it later, there's a different perspective or angle, and this is just the exact footage from yeah. later. It's not a misdirect, really, at all. <laughs> yeah, it's, so that, I haven't learned anything that made me think this scene wasn't what I thought it was originally. So that tells me it's a probably like a focus testing. We need to put this shot a little bit early to kind of start hot and get in somewhere. Uh, but I think that this movie was written for a much lesser actor to play this villain, because this villain is not written that good. Philip Seymour Hoffman elevates this villain. So I think it's a very mediocre written villain for what probably would have been better casting is a kind of forgettable actor (laughs) who is just someone who's just like, yeah, I'm like an evil accountant or whatever. I'll see you. I'll see you at the end of the movie. And like, that's it. AKA every other Mission Impossible villain. Yeah. Yeah, I don't remember a single one except Henry Cavill. So yeah. Uh, So like, this is one where I'm like, I think Philip Seymour Hoffman was so good. We were like, we have to put him around earlier but it's like you also need rewrites to get him in the whole thing because he's he's he takes it over and i think the fact that like as you say that scene i mean yeah it's tense there's a gun to someone we should know about we don't know her yet but we know we're going to care about this person's head and and ethan hunt our hero is tied to a chair and there there's clear stakes to the scene but the actual dialogue is so like you say like just basic it's just like it's a guy counting to 10 like you t- like obviously that's not interesting and philip seymour hoffman manages to go from like this like he's so deadpan and he's just like one two and he's like i'll do it and then when he gets to 7 and he turns on the full rage mm. and it's, and he repeats 7 he's like seven, seven and i'm not going to scream into your mic but like just like scream 7 as as he shoots her in the knee uh, and and Tom Cruise is freaking out and like so I literally a scene of a man counting to ten became 
almost iconic, I think, as like as far as like movie bad guys go. And on page, it's nothing. It's just a guy counting to ten and then shooting a woman in the leg. It is, yeah. Philip Seymour Hoffman is such a good actor, and I don't know if he naturally has the instincts or if he is one of those actors who used to go through his scripts and be like, it builds here, it builds here, and then it crescendos. Like, he knows that it's going to go, like, I have one to ten to build this, and mm -hmm. when do I start going up? And I make it, like, really something. Like, it's not... It's not anything. It's a it's a villain who's going to shoot someone. I'm like every single movie has a villain who's going to shoot someone. It's a Mission Impossible up until seven, which we're at right now. There's a villain who's going to shoot someone, but this one is wildly intense. Yeah, and they really like. I mean, Tom Cruise also does a good job of like yeah, giving does. the st stakes because he's freaking out, um, but also like trying not to freak out. So they're both like really, really elevating. And and Tom plays off of it really well with like with <laughs> Philip Seymour Hoffman kind of giving so little for a mm -hmm. lot of it. Tom going through every possible play that he has in the playbook to work with this, that also makes it really scary to be like, what are you talking about? I thought I gave it to you. I thought I gave it to you. Okay, I didn't give it to you. I find it though, it's in Paris. It's not in Paris. Well, okay, like him going through every conceivable, I, like this is how I would get out of this in a movie where things are easy for me. Mm -hmm. like, it's just like, oh man, it, it adds a lot to that scene. Yeah, yeah, I couldn't tell if he was doing everything I've been trained for or five stages of grief as like mm. oh, bargaining, yeah, anger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah I didn't trying, think about that, that's smart. Yeah. That, that is sm that's smart because they've turned it, that into like a small play. Yeah, and yeah. It, the thing that's so interesting about it that is not explored in the rest of the movie at all is it ends with an appeal to Philip Seymour Hoffman's humanity. Which where, is a weird choice. Because he has shown none, and and as far as Tom Cruise knows, has none, and is, is revealed in the rest of the movie, has none. Like, there's never a moment where we're like, oh, he actually has a little crumb of a, of a soul left. Like, he's just who he is, as you say. It's just an on-paper, straight-ahead bad guy who doesn't give a shit about anything and just wants to sell his something, because we never find out what it is, yeah. and make money. And so the fact that it ends with this appeal to a humanity that does not exist and is not explored in the rest of the movie is such a weird, odd note that is like a, like a, a bread trail to nowhere. And not to jump too far ahead, but it makes me wonder if at some point they were like, we're going to bring Philip Seymour Hoffman back. And real Ooh. life circumstances prevented that from happening. I will say his death is not like yeah. scene scene. Like he's pretty hardly hit by that bus, but like no body, no like exactly. he's got a bullet in his heart, no head uh. ripped off. Yeah, they definitely might have been like, we got to keep this guy for later. Like everyone can survive this if you don't like fully kill, kill them. He could have been like the the specter to the IMF yeah. type of a thing. Yeah. I was thinking the, the helmet Zemo, like we need this guy to do this thing. So he's sure. now on our team, even though he's a terrible person mm. and we find out more about okay. him as we go together. But yeah, like that, uh, like that is, that is the one thing that kept going through my head is like, are they like, there's, we know nothing about this character, this bad guy who is, Again, as you say, like becoming the star of this movie, even though he's only in very little of it. So I, I was wondering, like, it, there must be some reason behind these little breadcrumbs they're leaving. But it also is very possible that that was just the result of like ten thousand different versions of a script. Yeah, yeah, different versions of a script, and 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 a performer just elevating something yeah. to something special. I would say my last thing about opening an in media res is it always genuinely like. Not frustrates me, but insults me a little. Because whenever I see a movie and it opens with like the ending, I'm like, "Do you think I'm not gonna stay <laughs> and watch all of this? Yeah. I've paid. Like, if it's a theater, I'm like, I've paid my fifteen dollars. I'm gonna watch the whole movie, guys. This isn't like a YouTube trailer where you gotta grab me in five seconds. Like, I'm gonna be here. I'm not gonna march out of the theater if there's not an action scene in ten minutes and demand my money back. I think that was in the early two thousands a thing people were legitimately worried about or exactly. Executives were legitimately worried that it's like they're gonna refund. storm out. <laughs> you can ask, you might not get, but we you can always ask. Can always Wasn't there ask. some rule that if you leave in the first ten minutes, they have to give you your I money think back? I think there is actually yeah, still yeah. a rule like that. Weirdly, what? yeah. I mean, I have never used this, but I think it's like there's some time cut off where it's like, I. But in what world would it like you? you is know, that going to the movies? Uh, sure, it's easier when you're you know like. 14, 15, or I'm trying to, I was 20 when this movie came out. Yeah. yeah, it's a lot easier now than like when I gotta like get a babysitter and all that stuff. But it's still like, I've planned my day around doing this to yeah. some degree. Yeah. I didn't fall into this movie theater and go like, well, I'll give it two minutes. I and think even if a movie's terrible and I'm leaving, I'm gonna walk into a different theater. It's my day. <laughs> yeah, 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 I yeah, planned yeah, to yeah. be at the theater today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What are you gonna do? Eat you your popcorn at home? You exchange the ticket at the very least or just walk into, because I think the only time we've been close to that was like, 
a, a movie theater where it was like there was a, 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 a big torrential rainstorm that day and the roof was leaking and they had a bucket <laughs> that was bucket. catching it from the which wasn't in the way but it was like during quiet scenes in the movie you'd hear like bloop <laughs> bloop bloop and it's like that that might push me over like little shit like that that could do it uh, but it would have to be like a theater problem not a movie problem for me yeah the only scenario the only other scenario I could see is if you is if by you know timing or whatever you had to sit in the very front row of a massive screen, oh, you're like, I yeah. can't, this can't is just too painful. I've done that once in my life, and I'm like, I'm never again will I do that. That yeah. happened to us once before there was assigned seating. Yeah. And it was not an enjoyable experience. Now, why do those seats exist? Yeah. Thank you, assigned <laughs> seating. Never again. <laughs> never again. Never again in the front row. Now, I wanted to get back to something Andrew said briefly, and we didn't expand upon, which is that this movie is so good at, like, setting things up. And like you said, it's like... The lip reading is set up early, and it's set up as, like, he's charming and it's fun, but also we're establishing that he can read read lips. And then a scene, like, halfway through the movie, Billy Crudup is, like, telling him things without actually making any sound, and it's so awesome, and it's a great setup. They set up the the chip in the brain, what it does to Carrie Russell, so we know what it's going to do to Tom Cruise. So movies are just not good at setting up plot points, like, preemptively, and I'm just really impressed by, like, the tight writing in this one for a lot of these things. Yeah, I agree. and also the lip reading thing too. Not only is it like tight writing to use a something that's set up early in a way that seems heroic that is then part of the villain twist, like putting that flavor on a flavor, I think really adds an element of surprise to when uh, Billy Crudup's character is like, "I'm the villain," and I'm like. But we set up the heroes, the heroes thing with you. But we mm. set up the lip reading, and you paid it off like a cool dude. Who's <laughs> a, <laughs> you did a cool dude callback to the thing that we, as an audience, remember. You but, felt like a bro. And it, but don't you think that that adds to it? Because it clearly, it, their dialogue is very buddy buddy in the Seven Eleven where they meet. Or, or whatever yeah. the convenience store where they meet, and the and and the other. No, that was the Clark product place. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> and oh right, because they talk about Slurpees, right, or, or Big Gulps. Yeah. Um, but but so I think it's supposed to add to the we're really close that makes the betrayal all the worse. Yeah. Is that like not only are they colleagues who respect each other, but these are legitimate friends, and so like getting back to like you know the the kind of like running. Game of all, not all, but a lot of Mission Boss movies going back to the first one when it's the biggest betrayal of all, where it's, you know, the guy from the TV show is actually the bad guy and all that jazz. Uh, and Ethan Hunt's mentor is the bad guy. I think it's supposed to, like, really drive home. He he knows Tom Cruise. He knows Ethan Hunt so well. He knows his lip reading abilities. They're best. They're not best friends, but they're really good buddies. And they trust each other implicitly. And that's what makes the betrayal in the third act even worse is I think what they were going for. I get that. Yeah, I will say I felt like a very bad movie reviewer critic. I did not see this betrayal coming because this is my first viewing and mm. I did not know. So I was like, oh no. <laughs> like I genuinely felt hurt because there's always a betrayal in a Mission Impossible yes, movie. There like there be. always is. But I was sure it was going to be one of these two team members who never come back again mm -hmm. because I've seen the later movies. I'm like, oh well, either Maggie Q or John Reese Myers is going to be the betrayer because they're not in later movies. And I guess Billy Crudup isn't either, but I'm like, he's an administrator. <laughs> he, he's got like files. Lawrence Fishburne also isn't in the later movies. Yes. I know, but it just, well, like he was set up as already being a betrayer. Ah, so if he yeah, had yeah. been actually a betrayer, it wouldn't have been a surprise. So yeah, I was like genuinely like, oh shit, you got me. And I think I'm pretty smart. See, I was sure it was either going to be Crudup or Reese Myers because they have resting betrayer face. Like those guys <laughs> both <laughs> just have a smarmy face to yeah. them. No offense to either of them. They're both very handsome men, but you can be handsome and be smarmy. And they they both have that face that just looks like they're up to no good. And so I was sure and, – and I guess the – the I mean, I'm going back to when I saw it the first time. Obviously, it's cheating if I talk about seeing it now and being like, oh, I called it the whole I time. I called it. Uh, but I – and also like they do that thing and they do it very well where – they set up a guy who you think is the bad guy in Lawrence Fishburne, but he's acting so over the top as the bad guy for no reason, because of course he's actually a good guy, that it so clearly can't be him, otherwise it's just too on the nose. So I started looking around me like, okay, wait, it's guys, I agree, it's either Maggie Q or Jonathan Reese Myers, or I think the first time I saw it, there was a moment where I was like, Ving Rhames? Is, it, is this the movie where Ving Rhames was Oh, where he not turns. For, not for a second. <laughs> I never doubted Luther. 
Luther, when, the only guy who survived Luther, the whole series. Luther's was my rock. Yeah. <laughs> I am leaving this theater and asking for a refund if it's yeah. Luther. You well, look out, executives. Fair enough. Although he did get uh, sat on the bench for all of Ghost Protocol, so that, that we haven't explored why that happened. Uh, yeah, well, he's only had, in that at he all. He has like one scene. Right, I think like at the end or something, or like a quick or airport like thing. The, or he's, he's giving him the next mission and uh, updating him on 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 his wife and because oh, they've been right, separated. At this right, point. right, and that's right, when right, you find right, out his right. wife's actually alive. Yeah, mm-hmm. okay. Yeah, so yeah, it's it's weird, but he has he has like been like, I'm just gonna do these movies and that's gonna fucking rule for the rest of my life. Good yeah. on you, Ving Rhames. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ving, Ving's career has been like laying low otherwise, but he's just rock solid in here. Yeah. Yeah, he's the only him and Tom are the only ones around since the first, and then uh, yeah, I guess we got Michelle and Simon Pegg are the other ones who are like from this one on. Yeah, and right. Michelle only is like sparingly yeah. showing yeah, up. Michelle, Although I yeah. love Michelle Monaghan, she is she so pops. she is she so pops. cute and she is so charming. Like I want to marry her. I'm like <laughs> I get it, Tom Cruise. I would also quit the IMF for Michelle Monaghan. She's awesome. I I I I do have, and we can get to this maybe negative in a minute, but like. This movie does have some problems with its writing and fridging of female characters. Oh, yeah. But that moment where Ethan is unconscious and she becomes the active protagonist in her own story, mm. I was like, this fucking rules. Like, I was lit. Like, and also it was just like a great setup of like, you know, Ethan like telling her how to use a gun while looking for something to electrocute himself. I'm like, Multiple things happening simultaneously. It's really well written. It's really well paced. And now we get to see this uh, this captive actually be uh, actually have agency. And it was just a great sequence as well. And she sold the shit out of someone who's like shocked but surviving but dealing with a weird situation in a way that like I am also someone who has dealt with trauma and extreme situations in my in my medical career as well. So like I, I loved the way she did that sequence. I also liked it and I also really liked again how they set up very early just this throwaway line when she's talking to her girlfriends in the kitchen and they're like, you could never find a man who could keep up with you. You want adrenaline and someone who can oh, surprise yeah. you and you wanna you want like you wanna do big things. Cause they met on a helicopter or something. It was never very clear how these yeah, two met. Yeah, there was some like adventure mm. tourism. Some or something. kind of like helicopter thing. So like, you know, that's not quite I've been kidnapped and now have to kill men, but it is very much like, oh, she can handle like an adrenaline rush and she does want to kind of, she could do this if she had decided to do this. Yeah. Was a little bit established. So I'm like, good writing. Yeah. And I think even like she played the right level of pacing for all of it too. Like her, like in this moment of like reloading the gun and just like a couple of handshakes where it doesn't go in smoothly, but it's not oversold. Is this like, it's not like someone trying to get their keys in the door when Jason Voorhees is chasing them. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. But Why she, did I bring the 40 key stain? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Why did I bring my janitor keys yeah, yeah. from work? Uh, but she does it just like a couple of shakes and just plays this like real in between of not making it a caricature of an action badass or a a, a I'm complete panicked distress. Uh, so I, I I love where she's at in that sequence. Yeah, it does make me. Retroactively, even though, I, as I've said, Ghost Protocol is my favorite of the movies, it does make me a little bit retroactively mad about rewatching this about what they choose to do, where they nominally kill her off, then reveal that actually she's alive, but she's off being hidden under a secret identity. Like, because I do really think this movie sets up a, a world where they Mr. and Mrs. Smith it and she joins the team. Yeah. And the end of this movie very much indicates like she's meeting everyone at the IMF and her and Benji are, are chatting and all that stuff. And it does very much like not that I thought she was going to turn into to, you know you know like female Ethan Hunt, but I did think they were gonna there was gonna be a world where she was gonna be in other movies and doing cool stuff. And so it does make me a little bit sad that they're just like no, she's the she's you know she's his driving force and nothing else. And and yeah. that's a little too bad because I agree she could have been a badass addition to the movies. Yeah, I would actually say I don't know uh, I don't know that this movie is like bad to women. I actually like quite like all the stuff that goes on in this to the female characters. Maybe not the translator lady. She really got screwed over. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I would I say that out. would be my big thing, which is like opening uh, opening by killing Carrie Russell's character, uh, who is cool for a little bit and, and does get killed. I'm like, okay, like it's okay for a, a female character to be killed. This isn't always necessarily the primary motivation or fridging. But then it's like, we fake kill the wife, and it was like, remember the translator? And I'm like, 
I guess. <laughs> Weirdly, this feels kind of also grosser in a way to be like, we introduced another female character so that you could get them mixed up uh, and then killed her. And then I'm like, oh, okay. And then I think like as the franchise in the next one, then being like, we fake killed her twice. And I'm like, <laughs> I, I, feel, yeah. I feel like fake killing a wife twice starts becoming... But I get what you say. There I'm not going to blame moments of brilliance. I'm not going to blame MI3 for Ghost Protocol double killing Michelle Mon again. <laughs> but yeah, I think Carrie Russell gets to be such a badass even though she's like cuz she's like kidnapped off the top, but it's her very first mission and as soon as she gets that adrenaline rush, she's so cool and she's so good and like I do feel like she kind of dies with agency like into like for a plot point or whatever and like there's still a female on the team who doesn't die, which is shocking. Usually doesn't happen. And yeah, and then Michelle Mon and just gets to end this movie with being like, I'm as good as Ethan with no training. And I'm like, that's actually also <laughs> significantly badass. He has to train really hard. <laughs> I also live in a world where, even though it makes no sense, like fictional universes cro like kind of cross over in my brain. So I'm just like, yeah, yeah, she just went on and became uh, the American's lady. So it's like, you know, it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> like, even though that is obviously a different character, yeah. I'm just like, in my head, she got to keep being a super badass spy on this other thing. It still has a strong JJ energy yeah, yeah. if you carry it over. It is weird because I was thinking, I'm like, yeah, yeah, she's done action before. And I'm like, no, she didn't star in Alias. She was Felicity. That was not an action show. Because I'm like, yeah, yeah, Dirt or Alias, tons of action. I'm like, no, 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 no. Felicity was just like, I'm cute and my hair is curly. That was Right, but there was time travel. There was, but you oh, didn't yeah. need a gun. All right. It yeah. was not gun related. I've never seen a second I, of it. I just know there's time. I problems. do think that Jennifer Garner could have played Felicity, and I do also <laughs> think <laughs> I carry Russell could that have Carrie played Russell alias. could have played Alias. I so actually I would have loved Carrie I Russell. I do think alias. they could have flipsy doodled those roles pretty smoothly, and, and each has the range in order to do it. Also, the thing when it exploded in her head. The special effect was incredible. Oh, Actually, so, so many special effects in this movie are amazing. But yeah, like when it just like goes off and her head doesn't explode, which I love. Her eye just like really messes up and she goes wildly still. And you're like, yeah, yeah she's gone. And you hear a sound, I forget what the, the sound effect actually is, but it's almost like a computer breaking. Mm. It's not human, it's not a neck snapping, it's not, as you said, like the sound of like a gunshot going off and blowing brains out that we've heard in all these movies. It's very mechanical. And somehow that really added it to me too, that it's just like snap, snap, and her, as you said, her eye kind of bulges. And yeah, similar similar to the thing about the the, the disposable camera not exploding, but just like a little bit of smoke coming out. I love when the movie chose to go understated when we were expecting a big thing. Because I think watching that, you know, again, even watching it the second time, I'm trying to remember what it was like the first time, but I think we all kind of expected like, this isn't gonna work out for her. Maybe we all thought Ethan was gonna save her, but I don't think we were shocked by her death, but I was shocked because I thought the death was gonna be an explosion that like sends the helicopter flying. So when it's just this little twitch twitch, I was like, oh, okay, the movie's subverting, again, subverting expectations in a kind of very small but enjoyable way. And I, and I think they're doing a really good job as well of writing it as if uh, as if we're seeing the perspective of like the losing side, but it's still written like a heroic battle. Mm. So like, so a lot of the times in action movies, I will find that like lazy villain writing will be like, or, or you know, fridging of a character will be like, hey, I got the person that you love. Bang, they're dead. Don't worry about it. That's now your motivation. We're moving on. They don't even count to ten. But like they don't even count to ten. <laughs> Just one. But literally adding a countdown timer for the hero to win and it getting interrupted is something that's normally done with like a villain's device. Normally it's like a villain with a bomb that's counting down that the hero has to interrupt. So it really feels like it's like it it is a heroic scene that is completely subverted from the villain's perspective. And I I really like the level of detail that they have going down of an, of a literal like a ticking timer that gets interrupted. I do have to say about the Carrie Russell rescue scene, I have two, two things to say. One, uh, they so the beats of that and then the kidnapping Philip Seymour Hoffman, it's actually the same mission. It's get in, sneak into a place, get someone, get out. One is willing to come with you and one is not. But otherwise, it's the same heist mission of get a person out of a scenario and get away from the guards. And in, in Rome, as we've discussed, they have elaborate uh, costumes and they do all these like like little theater plays and there's a whole you know sequence in the tunnels and masks. And the move to get Carrie Russell out is just, <laughs> Bing Rames sets up a bunch of automatic machine guns and just shoots the shit out of the side of a building. I think to distract the guards. That's all they do. Location has a lot to do with it. All right. A warehouse by the windmill factory sheep farm. <laughs> 
Berlin's is, famous windmill factory sheep farm. We all know the windmill factory sheep farm. I've been to Berlin several times when people are like, do you want to go to the Reichstag? Do you want to go to Unter den Linden? No. Berlin's famous wind turbine slash sheep farm. Slash abandoned warehouse on the outskirts of town that you're able to shoot up and there's no civilians who are injured. <laughs> So there's that, which compared to, you know, the busy Vatican, you know, they don't want to, they don't want the Pope <laughs> catching a stray. Yeah. I agree. That would have been worse. <laughs> yeah. yeah. At the Vatican. Yeah. yeah. Luke, I'm not sure if you wanted more effort on Carrie Russell or more explosions at the Vatican. <laughs> what? I wanted more effort for Carrie <laughs> Russell. Oh, okay. I okay. wanted an element of subterfuge or something that suggested we thought about this for more than 30 seconds. Mm. Tom Cruise manages to steal the rabbit's foot with 15 minutes of play. Planning, which is a much more successful mission than rescuing Carrie Russell, which he had the entire flight to Berlin to work on. Yeah. That's like 15 hours. I don't yeah. know how long it takes. You'd know. Berlin, but, well, yeah, like six or seven hours, depending okay. on where you're leaving from. But yeah, and, and in fairness, with the, the, the stealing of the rabbit's foot, I mean, they did remember to bring their baseball pitching machine. Um, <laughs> and that was important. Yeah, did they just have that? <laughs> I've never really thought about that, but sure. They weren't, they weren't hand throwing those balls. You're no, right. No, no, they had a though, they had a full pitching machine that you would like warm up with at Major League Baseball mm, parks. Yeah. They did. Yeah, that could have. Maybe I'll take back my thing about establishing everything really well <laughs> in this movie about how everything was done. Maybe a little less as well established. Uh, how do we all feel about the fact that this movie's MacGuffin is just admittedly a MacGuffin? I that love that. They're just that. like, don't worry about it. We're not telling you. I love that because I don't remember what a single MacGuffin is in any single Mission Impossible movie. So what do I care what it was? Yeah. I love that it's just like, it's bad. I'm like, I believe you. This is great. I think it's very, it's a very good and smart wink and nod at everything, but it doesn't fit this movie. Because I don't think this movie is doing enough wink and nodding to fit a, we're just not going to tell you what this thing did the whole time. That, mm. that to me felt like a really fun, almost parody, but not quite parody of an action movie move. And this movie is relatively playing it straight. Again, we've mentioned a couple of things where like there's not a big explosion, stuff like that. But it's still like there are stakes and this matters. And it's not you know tongue in cheek enough for it to be like, Oh, and we're never going to tell you who cares what the thing is. We got to go get the thing. It doesn't matter. Yeah, I, 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 I'm, I'm of two minds on this. I, I, I kind of, I, I'm with both of you. I, I think it's, yes, I don't need to know it. I've never known any of the things, but also I agree it's not quite tongue-in-cheek enough. But I also think it is a year... The year it came out, this it wasn't ready to be more self-aware. Right. I do think that like this was a transitional time, and JJ was you know one of the people as well. Of uh, I do think that people with a television pedigree moving into film actually changed a lot of films self-awareness and playing with tropes where it did take people with a TV background to kind of treat the audience like, Hey, we've all watched 200 hours of this, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas prior to TV people moving to film, it was like the audience only exists in the two hour window. You are in this movie theater and you have no knowledge that exists outside of it. So I do think it has like a level of self-awareness that is again, it walks. So ghost protocol can run like it is, I think as much, much tongue in cheek as you can get away with without executives stopping you in this era of movies being released. That is very fair. That like they they couldn't do full Marvel movie style wink and nods that like later you know James Gunn could do for example later on. Yeah, I agree with that. That's yeah, fair. I also think it was pretty clear it was a biological weapon. It had like the cr skull and crossbones on it. Like this wasn't a USB drive with a virus on it. It was pretty clear what it was. I also actually will say I think not saying what it is really helps create kind of a timeless element to the movie because yep. your your ah. MacGuffin will not be outdated. Um, I can't remember what movie it was. It might be Charlie's Angels of all things. But like the thing they're trying to stop the villain from doing is like the villain wants to be able to track people by their cell phones. And it's like, <laughs> yeah, well, we just do that now. That's just a thing that is like, it's like villain plots can become outdated really quickly in action movies as technology progresses. So just being like, it's bad. Don't worry worry about it. Also, we will never show you a kind of cell phone because that also dates movies terribly bad mm, yeah. if you see what version of a phone someone's using. Interesting. And I think also, like, smartly, they were like, we, we didn't plant it on a specific country or terrorist group that is this country's enemy at the time oh, of the movie being released. Mm. Yeah, they're just like, it's the seller. Who's buying it? 
fucking somebody who's not good at it, whatever at whatever year you watch this movie, who is it we're worried about? It's them. It's that people. It's that person. I agree with that, but I will say the uh, the reveal when Billy Crowder reveals that he's the He's the guy who's been working with Davian, but it's not because he's just taking his money. It's because he has this plan to uh, track the sale of the rabbit's foot to a bad actor in the <laughs> Middle East that they can then use as a pretext for invasion. That sounds like they're not so subtly being like, this is what Dick Cheney did. <laughs> like, this uh, is like, it did feel a little bit political of like, so his plan is they're going to fake a weapons of mass destruction thing so they can invade a country. A false flag operation. Yeah. Well, so yeah, not quite a false flag. Not a false flag, but, yeah. but like we're going to give them the weapons of mass destruction so we can then invade them by saying they have weapons of mass destruction. And then it's, insert democracy. Exactly, yay, America. Yeah. Yeah. So it did feel like there was a, a, but don't get me wrong, America interfering in foreign countries and taking them over and disastrous results is not exclusive to the Bush-Cheney administration. So it is still timeless. But it did feel like there was a little bit of like, as he said that, I was like, so he's Cheney. Like, that's mm. like that's a little bit Cheney. I didn't so, see the connection because Crudup is a very handsome man. I'm like, no. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> that's not Cheney. This man's, never, looks yeah, yeah. this man's never been shot in the face. Yeah. <laughs> not Billy Crudup. Well, Cheney's never been shot in the face, but he shot a oh, guy in the do, face. He, yeah. shot the, he did yeah. the shooting. You're right. He then Sorry. apologized to yeah, him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> that's uh, nothing scary about that. Uh, but that is a connection. I that never, man is still alive. Can I you believe that. <laughs> There's no God. Him and Kissinger. Uh, it's not fair. But, uh, <laughs> what the hell? This is the, this, see, I never, I never would have put, uh, you know, Dick Cheney's gun to my head. I never would have put that comparison together. So that's, that's why we need a political commentary. Yeah, sorry for getting show. all serious. No, I love it. I love it. It's a level of awareness that I, I hadn't put together. Uh, and also just even like to think of the timelines as to when this was released and what was going on then. Yeah. I'm impressed you can remember what anything happens in a particular year. <laughs> Well, Not this is, me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> My timeline starts when Iron Man and the Dark Knight come out in the same year. Yeah. And I'm like, that's yeah. when time starts, 2008. <laughs> After that, Classic. nothing. Film yeah. time, that's when it starts. <laughs> that's when movies start. Yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, I was actually going to piggyback off a thing you said earlier, but I didn't want to interrupt, about um, I think JJ actually, uh, I've uh, read this interesting thing that I think is very true about how J.J.'s film work, I think in this one and because he did Star Trek next, he ruined parody movies and you can't make them anymore. Like like big, like big scary movie, Austin Powers-y, like, like making fun of tropes movies because he then started making movies that make fun of their own tropes. Right, as they do And do it them. with sincerity. Doing with sincerity, yeah. but like with a wink and a nudge. Like you can't make a Star Trek parody after you watch J.J.'s Star Trek because it's not a parody, but it all, but it acknowledges every trope. Ah, mm. okay, okay. Like the difference between like p pastiche and satire type of a thing, but like you've made pastiche the mainstream thing and you can't do both simultaneously. Yeah, yeah. so kind of what you're saying about how like he brought a certain like, we all know what's happening, familiarity to movies that like wasn't really there before. But it only kind of works on a franchise. You can't do it with a standalone, but. Interesting. Yeah, I hadn't thought, of it from that, thought about it from that perspective, but that is, uh, yeah, that's a very interesting take. It does kind of mess with the idea of doing satire and parody of it. But it does also set the tone for what this series becomes, because even little things like the subversion of the like, uh, 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 Luke bring up like the the disposable camera. It just kind of fizzles. It's not a big thing. Uh, I think in the next one in Ghost Protocol, it's like the payphone, and he has to go back and like hit it. And, and they have to keep up. they have to keep finding these one upmanship ways of how do we subvert what your expectation of this exact moment is. Uh, so I think it's like we've got to play this game of one upsmanship of of subverting it. You know? Yeah. Also, in this movie, it's the first time we see how the masks work because like every other movie will be like we just showed up in a mask and you didn't know if it was us or not and we're yeah. so clever and it's like I guess it was probably clever but you didn't show me how you did it and this movie is the first time you're like this is how we do it this is how we make the mask the scene where the mask turns into Philip oh, Seymour Hoffman yes. is incredible Incredible. Who, whoever the I editor actually, is in this movie. I actually like checked the date to be like what year did they do that transformation scene? It was awesome. Yeah, just like like it's Tom Cruise in a mask and then like Ving Rhames like touches his eyes and suddenly it is Philip Seymour Hoffman. It's flawless. I don't know where they hid the 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 cut, but it's very well done. I think I know and it's another one of these things where I'm like I think you subverted 
what people who would even try to figure out how this works do. Because, like, the camera sweeps past, and there's one moment where Ving Rhames' arm fully obscures the camera. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and like, you know, we're all kind of, like, used to certain language in movies, and we see that, and, like, immediately my mind is like, that's where the switch happens. But but the camera keeps moving, and it's visibly not when the switch happens. Yeah, yeah. The camera keeps moving, and it's still Tom Cruise in a mask, and then as Ving Rams pushes it down, it becomes Philip Seymour Hoffman. And it, it took me a minute. I think what they did was when that arm obscures the camera is when they switch to Philip Seymour Hoffman. Uh, but they like use CGI to make him look like Tom Cruise in a loose mask. So they reverse okay. what you think you would do with digital effects or with any kind of interlacing. So rather than be like, how do we transition one to another, or transition Tom to Philip, it was like, let's have a cut in the middle. And that cut is we kind of reverse time transition Philip to Tom. Ooh, that's uh, interesting. It's not what I read how they did it. But oh, like, okay. But you're, but it might, but that might be like part of it because it was very short. I didn't see a video. I read an interview with the VFX editor, and they just said they filmed like a whole one with Tom in the mask, and they filmed the whole one with Philip Seymour Hoffman, and just like merged them. Uh, but your your but idea of like, yeah, the, where did the merge still point gotta find go? A point. You still yeah. gotta find the point. But and I it's love not, that. And it's not when the and, and it's yeah. not when the arm is in front of the screen. No, it's that's not. And that's the version, and that's what's so yeah, cool about and, it. Yeah. And I love that again. Yeah, exactly what you said. Because yeah, I love that they still have the arm obscure the camera, but that's not you know what I mean. Because mm-hmm. you could just not have the arm obscure the camera, but like no, no, we're gonna do the obvious edit point and then not use it and then hide the edit point somewhere else. That's yeah, that that scene. It's so funny. Right before you texted me asking me to do do this on the pod, so that that scene I saw on on uh, a social media app that's dying with a bird logo. Um, <laughs> As people were like like sharing that and just being like marveling at the editing of it. So it was like this great like literally like a day before you texted me. And I was just and I was just rewatching that clip for like three times trying to figure out where the edit point was and I couldn't do it. But I'm, you know, not a very technically like I've never, you know, been an editor or a filmmaker. So it's just fascinating to watch and and just marvel at someone being very good at their jobs. And then I, I also want to kind of continue this thought into it is great. And truly hilarious watching Philip Seymour Hoffman play Tom Cruise as Philip Seymour Hoffman. Whole, the way he moves and scurries, and he's just got this, like, I'm a big man, but I'm light and quick. Like, there's just, he just nails it. When he has to go through, like, the rafters, and he's, like, doing Tom Cruise shit, and even, like, uh, the the other guy, what's your name, John Michael Ryles or something? Jonathan yeah. Reese Myers yeah. is, like, watching it happen. He's like, whoa. And I'm like, oh, no, <laughs> you, you shouldn't be impressed. You know that's Tom Cruise in a mask as a character. But even he is like, oh, he's so fast as a big man. I yeah. will admit, like, even knowing, obviously, that is actually Philip Seymour Hoffman, not Tom Cruise in a Philip Seymour Hoffman mask, I forget. I'm just like, that is, he that is, is so, Tom Cruise yeah. in a I'm like, yeah, it's Tom Cruise. Mask. Of course it's easy for him to do it. I was just about to bring up this exact same point, although it happens to me in a lot of movies. Like, I never would have, like, been like, Michael, C- uh, he, he was so good as Tom Cruise. I'd be like, no, it was Tom Cruise the whole time. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> they have the mask technology. We saw them put it on him. They have the face-off machine. They put <laughs> Philip Seymour Hoffman in the face-off machine. They put machine. Tom Cruise yeah. in the face-off machine. They made him Philip Seymour Hoffman. And even comedy-wise, the moment when Philip Seymour Hoffman as Ethan Hunt uh, looks down through the bottom of a Ferrari and goes, not much, what's up with you? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's, that's my favorite line. Fuck. Kills it, kills it, so good. The, the crime of being that talented of Philip Seymour Hoffman is that if he wanted to, he could have been a uh, Jack Black level funny physical oh, comedian. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Along Came Polly is not a great movie. You don't need to rent it. You just <laughs> need to YouTube the scene where one, they play basketball, and two, Philip Seymour Hoffman is walking into the wedding and does a pratfall. And I know that's like a pratfall. Who cares? There's been eight million of them. It's the funniest thing that's ever been put on film. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing is funnier than Philip Seymour Hoffman confidently walking towards Ben Stiller, doing a huge fall, and then carrying on as if nothing had happened. Right. It is the funniest thing that's ever been made. I'm sorry to everything else. But it's he's unbelievable as a physical comedian. And I think it's just like he in other roles has that mastery of his own body where like he knows how to carry himself with with different weight, with different urgency, whether it's direct or indirect. Like he knows where his body is in space in any given time. Uh, so it's like you think you know how he moves, but he, he – 
he manipulates his body for each individual role, typically for dramatic purposes, whether that might be like he's walking, you know, like heavier or drunk and indirect or whatever it might be. Uh, but he can do it for comedy too, which is just brilliant. Also, like he he doesn't like, as you said, he like kind of re he inhabits Tom Cruise in this. Like when he like making himself like read the cue card, and you're like, well, that's Tom Cruise and that's Philip Seymour Hoffman. Mm. These are two different men. But he's also incredible because he's a big, big man. No. But in other movies, he can make himself seem so small. Like Capote was a tiny man, and you watch Capote, and you're like, small guy, yeah, 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 yeah. But it's like, no, he's a huge, giant man. He's yeah, like, and like Boogie Nights, he has this like energy of this tiny. Like dude who just wants to disappear into the corner, mm -hmm. and he the fact that he can have that and be this booming, you know, center of the room attention guy is amazing. Yeah, he was too talented to stay. It's <laughs> it's unfortunate. <laughs> R.I.P. R.I.P. Philip Seymour Hoffman. Well, I'm feeling pretty good on Mission Impossible Three. How you feeling? I'm feeling good. I'll watch it again. This Luke, was how fun. you feeling? You got anything? Any last nuggets you wanted to throw out that we didn't get to? I mean, I shouldn't because you've wrapped it up very well. No, but I will please, throw one. Please, there is. I just have to say one last thing, which is, I just want. You know, I, I'm sure if people are listening to this podcast, they've seen Mission Impossible Three. Go back and just watch the bridge attack scene, and not the. You don't even need to watch the whole thing, but there's a moment where. When they when it first happens and and we're at the point in the movie where they've captured uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman, they ha they hung him out of the plane. He wasn't intimidated at all. He reversed all the power in that scene and he and learned that Ethan Hunt's name was Ethan. And then they're transporting him and he gets rescued by the helicopter guys. And they need to split Tom Cruise and Ving Rhames up. Uh, and the way they do that is Tom Cruise points out there's a woman who's hurt. And Ving Rhames goes over to take care of her. And then, so now Ving Rhames is far enough away that he can yell his lines, which is much more interesting, of where the gun is and Tom Cruise can run all around. There is, I assume they were losing the light or something because there is a delivery from the woman who is hurt where she says the words, and this is how she delivers them, it's bleeding really bad. Am I going to be Okay. <laughs> With that level of concern mm -hmm. yeah. and commitment yeah. to I her craft this. as an actor. While Ving Rhames is screaming at yeah. Ethan Hunt. And there is explosions and shooting and craziness is happening. There is just a woman who I don't know if she has acted in anything else. I'm not sure how she got this role. But just with the calmness of someone who is like, you know, slightly but not overly concerned about her grade on her midterm. <laughs> just yeah. being like, it's bleeding pretty bad. <laughs> uh, am I going to be okay? Am I, I going to be okay? And, and I really do think it was just a, like, they realized they're like, so Ving went over and helped her. Uh, Luther's helping her. But we need him to fully leave the scene. Why does he have to continue helping her? And just, like, on set, they were probably like, give her this line. I'm bleeding pretty bad. Am I going to be okay? And then, then he'll help her limp off or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, the cool delivery of, like, an IMF agent who's been shot <laughs> instead of a random yeah. civilian in a car who is in part of a terrorist bombing as far as she knows. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not the, not the energy you would bring to the role. <laughs> no. Just a, a truly wonderful, well, we have to use that because we've lost the light moment in filmmaking history. We only got one yeah. take. And that prior to an iconic physics bending Tom Cruise getting ratcheted against another car Ooh. because an explosion oh, yeah, is behind yeah, yeah. him. Who cares if the force of direction doesn't line up? It looks amazing. Yeah, that's it's, it's a great stunt. It's that the it only way to make him stop running. Yeah, <laughs> and there's a lot of good running in this movie. Oh they really, boy. they really set the camera wide and let him run. When he runs down the whole river to get to Jules at the very end, yeah, it's such a long run. And he's so fast. Frankly, I like it better than some of Tom's recent stunts, where I'm like, let the there's like a point in that that run sequence in Shanghai where he just jumps from like three only kind of high rooftops, <laughs> up one up, but it's a long one take where I'm like Tom Cruise just dropped uh, about eight feet and then about eight feet and then about ten feet and holy shit he is going and he's just booking it and I'm like this is this is pretty cool actually <laughs> this is pretty yeah, cool. I think our other favorite stunt was like the van stops and him and Carrie Russell just get off the roof in one one shot. Oh, oh yeah, and that it's was so good. quick. The coolest things in this movie are so quick, but they like really gave it the attention to detail of like, no, we're gonna make the tiny things, quick things, like so cool, like the mask getting off the roof. Yeah, yeah. I do like that again. Talking about walking, so they could run later on. That they were just like, okay, so Tom Cruise running while Simon Pegg directs him. We're gonna do that again. Yeah. <laughs> like this is yeah. we, this we know this works. We're opening the next movie yeah, yeah, yeah. with this. Yeah. yeah, we've we've got it. They've done it several times yeah. now. Yeah, the I think it's in like 
fallout where he's like, he's on rooftops and Simon Pegg thinks he's on ground level. <laughs> yeah, and he's like, turn left. And he's like, uh. <laughs> uh, That building is 40 stories below me. Yeah, so I, good. I mean, I really like the ghost protocol of like the the prison thing when Tom's like giving the hand that. signals and it cuts to Benji in the van being like, yeah, I know what the circle means. <laughs> That's not where you're supposed to go right now, Ethan. Uh, uh, so many good movies in this franchise. Well, let's go into the close. Let's ask the final question of what would you change? So now that we've discussed everything we've discussed, what would you change about this movie if you could change anything? Before we do ask the final question, we will remind you as we do every week, please take a moment to rate, review, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Podcast Static, wherever you might get your podcasts. We would love that. It would help us in our hearts and on the charts, as we say on this podcast. Uh, it really helps us move up the charts. It really helps us feel good about ourselves. We get a five-star review and if people are checking us out and there's new reviews you're like these guys are current and good we're hip and happening that's what we want to be that's what we want to be uh, and as well while well, it takes a couple of minutes to it only takes like a minute or two to leave a review for us do it for a couple of your favorite podcasts out there it helps every single podcast you listen to find new listeners and it means a lot to us so do it for a couple of the podcasts that you love and if you do want to support the podcast monetarily you can do that over on Patreon which is a monthly subscription service where you can subscribe at whatever is in your budget, be that $1, 5 10 20 you know what numbers are. You choose whatever number works for you. You can subscribe on a, on a monthly, you can subscribe on a yearly, and you get different cool bonuses depending on what you subscribe at. Yeah, at the $3 level, you get this podcast early and ad-free, which is two fun things about it, especially when we cover a new, new movie. If you're wondering, like, before the weekend hits, if you should see it, you can find out at the $3 level. Yeah, we'll be getting you that Dead Reckoning uh, episode ASAP if you're over on the Patreon. So you'll be getting it uh, pretty much like day that we've seen it. You'll be getting those fresh, fresh takes over there. And as well, at the $10 level, you get a bonus episode of this podcast every single month, and you get immediate access to the full back catalog as well. Yeah, and this month we did Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. If you want to hear us talk about Indian aliens, you're going to have to go to patreon.com slash from superheroes. Absolutely. He met Aliens for an extended period for an of time. extended period of time, and uh, I don't want to give you spoilers for the new one, but they don't bring up that he's <laughs> met aliens <laughs> in the new Indiana Jones. They don't have a single scene where Harrison Ford is like, "I've met aliens before." <laughs> they never say it. So we have to talk about it over on the Patreon page. So check out our Patreon page right now at patreon.com slash from superheroes. That is P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash from superheroes. And thank you to all of our current and future patrons. We love you, patrons. Thank you so much. And now let's go in for the close. Let's ask the final question of what would you change? Diana, let's start with you. What would you change? Um, My change is kind of just... I think it might mostly be for me because I don't think this is necessarily bad, but it's not how I like things. Um, the rest of the team gets fully cut out of the finale of this movie. And even though I think the finale works with just like Ethan and Julie, um, Julie like kind of saving themselves and like being together, I'm like, I like a whole team being together. So uh, I'm going to say the team doesn't just abandon him to die and go home, <laughs> yeah. which is a bold choice and not usually how these guys go about things, even when Ethan is like, just leave me to die and go home. Um, so in my version, they're like, they're still there and they're helping and like, one of them probably dies and is the betrayer. It's weird none of them are the betrayer because they're not in later movies. Wow, they really didn't like these people. <laughs> um, yeah, I would like... Maybe they're not in later movies because they left him to die. Yeah, he's like, well, I don't trust you guys. You didn't come back and save me. Maybe, yeah, that might be it. Um, so yeah, I just uh, I would like this new team fleshed out a little more so I care about them and I think they should be there in the finale. They never leave. They like they watch him get taken somewhere in that limo and they're like, all right, so he's here and we'll go rescue him later. And they probably help Benji find him with find Jules where she is a few blocks away or something. Yeah, something like that. I need the I need the team in the end because I'm like, wait, you just left. <laughs> Rude. And it also kind of highlights how forgettable the other members, other than Luther, the other members of the team are. That once Benji shows up, you're just like, well, yeah. Like there was part of me in my brain that was like. Well, Benji and Ethan have been the whole movie. There was no other. <laughs> like, I yeah. literally forgot other characters existed. And that's not just, like, history rewriting itself, because obviously I know Benji now more. It's just a, like, well, you two are not on set together, and you have more chemistry and charisma mm. than any of the other cast members yeah, do. Yeah, yeah, There's a reason Simon Pegg made it through. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I love this. Thank you. Hmm. Uh, Luke, what about you? What would you change about this movie? 
Um, yeah, I gave away the big one uh, with uh, with not killing uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman's character and bringing him back, which is really not changing this movie because, as you said, Diana, like you don't really see him. They could easily have brought him back in the next one or the one after that. But especially with Ghost Protocol, he so easily could have been the one who was supplying the nukes to the guy who wanted to start the war. Like mm. he could have fit in <laughs> to that plot so easily. And you know, you know nothing about his character, so it would have been interesting to see that fleshed out. Um, obviously. I don't remember the exact timing of it all because I, but you know, real world circumstances might have prevented that. And uh, as we said, RIP. But uh, so a smaller one uh, is there is a number two to Owen Davian, who's played by a fairly well known British actor. His name I do not remember. Uh, I think he's playing a German because yeah. he's in the he's the one in the factory scene and he's uh, speaking in German at that point. And he just kind of wanders off mm-hmm. uh, where he's there when they're. Th- killing uh, Ethan Hunt's wife, even though we find out it is the translator. And then I do not believe, and I could be wrong, that you ever see him die or come back in any way. Is his job just nose stuff? It seems does to be mostly just, nose he, stuff. He just stuck, sticks things up your nose. Yeah. But yeah, you're right, he doesn't die because there's that great moment where Jules kills Billy Crudup and he's yeah. like, I got killed by the wife. <laughs> <laughs> you can see it on his face that he's like, I got killed. But yeah, that guy just kind of, he could be the next villain or something. Yeah, so I guess I would just say like, you know, have him do something and then, and or just, you could have edited him out and Davian is the one putting stuff up people's noses because that would have been fine sure, too. Sure, sure. So it seems like maybe, because that is a very good actor, so maybe you could have given him a little bit more to do so that's my very small one but I, like I said I gave away the big one off top which is just more Philip Seymour Hoffman mm, I love that because it would have really made sense why in the fourth one they have to make Jules be dead like mm, why they yeah. would fake her death again if Philip Seymour Hoffman was still alive absolutely yeah because yeah, yeah. he, he, yeah, yeah, he would be looking for her <laughs> yeah yeah I could also see like that actor like if they if they were to bring back the the Philip Seymour Hoffman character if they you know had planned to or were that like the guy who wandered off would be the one who like I found you on the road and mm. like got you oh, back to hell yeah, yeah, yeah. so then mm. it would be kind of them together maybe mm, that yeah. would have worked yeah. Yeah. but yeah give, uh, give good actors stuff to do yeah. Yep. Love that. Andrew, what would you change? Uh, well, I, ag- I agree with both of these. Uh, more Philip Seymour Hoffman, uh, get the team together, and, uh, and uh, uh, yeah, well, one guy shouldn't wander off. I think this is all very good. <laughs> uh, uh, one of my weirder changes, I think, that I've ever said on this podcast is that uh, – is that I I wish this movie didn't set the precedent for everything afterwards. That I kind of wish that this franchise didn't become samey after this mm. one. I I like a De Palma, John Woo, J.J. Abrams, <laughs> and then I'm like, what? I like the and you know I think Brad Bird really does make something unique with what Ghost Protocol is. But I want this franchise to go back to like we've got a wet and wild director who's doing something that you are either gonna love or fucking hate. Uh, cause like, it's like, this is all, the series has been great, but it's been samey. Mm. Uh, it's been samey and I, I, I want to see more like wet and wild stuff. So I don't, it kind of changes things going forward, but I'm like, I don't know, maybe people, I wish people didn't quite like this as much as they did at the time that like, it wasn't quite as successful and they were like, let's do something weird. Uh, so that would be kind of like maybe my change going forward because for the most part, my other changes are just agreeing with both of you that it should be more Philip Seymour Hoffman, uh, in this one. Uh, because yeah, I feel like Philip Seymour Hoffman in this role was very much like Heath Ledger as the Joker in Dark Knight, Mm. uh, where they were like the star of this movie's Two-Face. And then it came out and they were like, oh, fuck. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) So if you look at the script of the Dark Knight, the star of that movie is Two-Face, but the star of that movie is not Mm. Two-Face. So I feel like they kind of had that moment. So more Philip Seymour Hoffman would have helped with that. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. I'm not sure if I agree that like, Ghost Protocol shouldn't have happened after this. <laughs> That's your idea. It's a tough one. Ghost <laughs> Protocol takes this and refines it to within a razor's edge, but then everything afterwards becomes kind of fun but same. Yeah, I will say after Ghost Protocol, I actually can't differentiate them in yes. any way. I'm yeah. like, Rebecca Ferguson's there, and that doesn't oh, help because yeah. she's in all of them now. So I'm like, hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, that's going to do it uh, for this week for talking about Mission Impossible 3. We will be back next week talking about the new Mission Impossible. We'll be talking about Dead Reckoning Part 1. Luke, thank you very much for being here and chatting with us uh, about this movie. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, Where can the people find you or your, your works? Uh, yeah, you can check me out uh, on Twitter. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we've never laughed at a plug before, and you know, we've plugged our own Twitter, so there's no shame here. But You're so funny, it is, Luke. It is, 
unplugging Twitter. So random. I mean, I don't have Instagram. Uh, <laughs> I put all my bags, all my eggs in this fucking basket. Uh, no, I, you know, whatever. Uh, follow the Beaverton wherever you get your social media. We apparently need to join some new ones, so we'll be working on that. Uh, at the Beaverton wherever we are. Uh, and uh, yeah, no, that's about it. Sweet. TheBeaverton.com, at the Beaverton. Yep, exactly. Love it. Uh, and uh, you can find me online at Ivamy, I-V-I-M-E-Y, on Instagram. Uh, as well, if you're in the Toronto area, I am going to be putting on a show at Toronto's Comedy Bar on July 18th. Uh, it is a fantastic show with some of my funniest friends, and it's a fundraiser for the Friends for Life uh, bike rally, which is a, a bike rally that uh, raises money for the People with AIDS Society in Toronto. Uh, so it's a great cause. It's a great show. Come on out July 18th at Toronto Comedy Bar. You'll find details on my social media at Ivamy, I-V-I-M-E-Y. And you can find me on Tumblr at Words of Diana. It's coming back and you can find me there. I never left Tumblr. I've been there the whole time. <laughs> Fools you. She's been there the whole time. Uh, at last the Twitter, bitches. <laughs> <laughs> and you can find both of us at From Superheroes and you can visit FromSuperheroes.com to find our other podcasts and wonderful content. We'll talk to you all next week. Bye. Bye.